Welcome to NCLEX PN Review, produced by Nursing Tutorial and Consulting Services. This section is on pharmacology. I'm Judy Miller and I will be your presenter. The first segment that we're going to talk about under pharmacology is administering medications. And as we start to talk about that, we're going to review some very basic things that you learned in the very beginning. Always check the expiration date of your medication. Check the label. Check the patient identity. Now, when you're checking patient identity, if you're administering medications, the best way to check patient identity is with the ID band. So you look at the ID band and make sure it matches the patient for whom the medication is prescribed. Um, if the patient cannot tell you who he is, or if the patient does not have an ID band, you say to him, uh, could you tell me your name? You don't say, are you Mr. Smith? There are patients that if you say, are you Mr. Smith, they'll say yes. Are you Mr. Jones? Yes. Are you, are you Mr. White? Yes. Uh, and they really don't know who they are, particularly in your older population, or people who have been medicated. So check the ID band, have them tell you who they are. Ask, if necessary, you could even ask the loved ones who may be at the bedside to verify the name of that patient. Now, there are some things that you want to teach patients when you um, are giving medications. Alert patients, you need to teach them about the drug. You tell them what the drug is and what it's for. Uh, the patient is taking it. This is not a big secret. Tell them what drug they're taking and what it's for. Stay with the patient until the drug is taken. Some patients will say, I'll just put it on the bedside table and I'll take it later. Now, that's not appropriate. Um, make sure that they take it. Some patients will actually put the drug in the, a pill in the corner and they get caught in their cheek or they'll put it under their tongue. Stay with them until the drug uh, is taken. We ought to give the medication within 30 minutes of the prescribed time. Chart it immediately. Uh, don't wait until the end of the shift to chart drugs uh, that you administer. And obviously you would observe for therapeutic and adverse effects. And what that means is that you must know the desired action of the drug and you must know the possibility of adverse effects and what they might be. Now, I also want us to look at giving particular types of medications. And the first thing I want us to look at are intramuscular drugs. So if we're giving drugs IM, there's a wide range of gauge needles. Now remember, the bigger the number, the smaller the needle. Um, so anywhere from 18 to 23 gauge needles, uh, we can give, uh, they are usually one to two inches long. You remember you pull the skin taut and inject the needle uh, at a 90 degree angle. And this is how you give IMs. Now there are a number of injection sites for IMs. Remember that for children, we are not gonna use the gluteal site for small children. They just don't have enough muscle there. Some people don't like to use it even for adults anymore, but certainly not for children. For children, we might use a deltoid in the arm, so that's a site that we can use for infants. We can also use the vastus lateralis. Now notice uh, in this picture you can see the femur with the dotted lines, so that's your thigh bone, the femur, and then you see the vastus lateralis, this muscle on the outside of the thigh. You want to give it right in the belly of the muscle in that middle third, in the center part of that and that's where a good site for IMs. You can use it for children. You can also use that site for adults as well. Another site I want us to talk a little bit about are the gluteal sites. We have both dorsal gluteal and ventral gluteal. This is talking about dorsal gluteal. Now, you can see structures here you want to avoid. This big part in here, this is uh, your sciatic nerve. You want to avoid that. Uh, because it, putting a needle in that could cause uh, lots of pain and misery for, for a person. You also want to avoid this gluteal artery right in here. Now, the way that you're supposed to locate a, a site if you use the dorsal gluteal site is to locate the head of the femur and put one hand there, locate the posterior superior 
uh, iliac crest, this back part of the iliac crest, and make a line connecting those two. And then you want to administer that in that upper outer quadrant where these two fingers are here. So that's the appropriate site for administering. Now if we take a look and compare that site, which is right here, with the old fashioned way of making a little crosshatch mark on the buttocks, you come out with the exact same site. But this is the more scientific way. So you want to find the great, greater trochanter and the posterior superior iliac crest and make that line and then make your part. Today we like to use anatomical landmarks so that's how they would describe it for you. Now the ventrogluteal site can be used when your patient is side lying and in this one we use the uh, the greater trochanter as our marker so you put the heel of the hand on the greater trochanter but now we're looking for the anterior superior iliac crest. So the front part of the iliac crest. So you put the heel of your hand on the greater trochanter. You put your index finger on that anterior superior iliac crest. Spread your fingers and now you have an area where you can give an IM injection. Now these anatomical landmarks is how they would refer to the sites. Remember that it's, it is hard to get those sometimes in people that are carrying excess tissue. Uh, so people that are heavy and overweight, it's sometimes very hard to find those anatomical landmarks. But that's what I would look for in questions about IM injections. Now subcutaneous injections are given at a shallower angle, so not deep into the muscle, just into the subcutaneous tissue. Look at the size needles. These are smaller needles, 25 to 29 gauge needles. Some of your insulin syringes are 27, 29 gauge. And they're about 3 eighths to an inch long. So they're relatively short needles. Oftentimes they're the 3 eighths half inch needle. With a subcutaneous injection, you're going to pinch the skin and inject at a 45 degree angle. So you pinch up the skin and put it in at a 45 degree angle. Um, now insulin is often given at a 90 degree angle because if we're using a 29 gauge 3 8 inch needle or uh, that's a very short needle and in most people a 90 degree angle goes into the sub Q uh, layer. However if the question described the patient as being extremely emaciated then you would need to use a 45 degree angle for insulin. All right, now there are sites if, that you can use to administer subcutaneous injections. The outer aspect of the upper arm, the anterior thigh, and then the abdomen staying at least an inch, one to two inches from the umbilicus. And this picture shows you some of the sites. Those in the back are seldom used. Certainly patients cannot self-administer into those sites. And when you're giving frequent injections, as you might be of insulin or heparin, they need to rotate sites. Heparin, by the way, is usually given in the abdomen sites. So heparin would be given in the abdomen sites. Insulin can be in the arm, the abdomen, or the thigh. Now intradermal injections are <clears throat> given at about a 10 degree angle, almost flat. We use a 25 to 27 gauge needle and this one you're going to stretch the skin taut and inject almost flat, about a 10 degree angle. Now intradermals you don't want a massage. Most intradermals are, are frequently used for skin testing. So we often use uh, for the tuberculin skin test in the ventral forearm. So that area in that ventral forearm on the tuberculin skin test. Now the area in the upper back, uh, the scapula area, the upper chest is often used for allergy testing. Another type of drug administration would be rectal drugs. I don't have to tell you to use a glove and have it, the suppository should be moistened 
with a water-soluble lubricant such as KY Jelly or Surge Lube. The tapered end is what gets inserted and it goes in a couple of inches so that it goes past the internal and external sphincters. Then you usually need to pinch the buttocks because when you put something through the sphincters, there is an urge to defecate. So you want to pinch the buttocks until that urge has gone by. Most of the rectal drugs, we ask them to retain for 10 or 20 minutes, say, if they were getting a uh, Dulcolax suppository, for instance. Uh, some rectal drugs can stay in longer than that, like um, if you were giving a suppository of aspirin or um, some other Tigan and other medication. The next type of medications we want to look at are eye medications. Now the easiest way to administer eye medications is with a client supine on their back and the head turned a little bit toward the affected side. Remember the eye drops go into the conjunctival sac, so you want to pull that lower lid down and then put the drops into the conjunctival sac. They don't go on the pupil or the iris, they go into this conjunctival sac. And remember to put a little pressure on the inner canthus and that keeps the medication from going out the tear duct and into the systemic circulation. It also uh, prevents the patient from getting a runny nose. Another type of medication to look at are ear medications. And in this one, you want the client uh, with their head on the unaffected side, cleanse the outer ear so you're not putting it into a dirty environment. And to straighten the ear canal, remember that for adults, it needs to go up and back and for children it goes down and back. The ear canal is shaped a little different. Now that children, those are infants and toddlers. Older children and adults, it is up and back. You put in the drops. Um, it's nice if they'll lay on their side for five or ten minutes. If they don't have the time or the inclination to do so, you could take a piece of cotton, moisten it with a little bit of the medication, and stick it in the ear. Now, don't put dry cotton in the ear because that will suck up, wick up the medication. It's got to be a little moist cotton that goes in the ear uh, and that will help to keep the, the drops in place. I want us to talk a little bit about how drugs are metabolized and we can get some general rules about that. Uh, drugs that are given by mouth go first to the liver, so they're picked up in the portal circulation, go to the liver, get detoxified, broken down, and then out into the systemic circulation. They take longer to act uh, because they have to go through this whole detoxification breakdown process before they get into the systemic circulation. This isn't how IM and IV drugs are metabolized. IM and IV drugs get into the systemic circulation first and then go to the liver. They act more quickly. Uh, so if you want a drug to act fast, you give it IM or IV. Uh, remember that oral medication will take longer to act. We said that many drug, most drugs are broken down by the liver. All oral drugs pass through the liver. Um, so really all medications pass through the liver. So they get broken down in the liver. Liver toxicity is then a very common toxicity to many, many drugs. Now some have greater liver toxicity than others, but it's a common toxicity for drugs. Now most of the time they're broken down in the liver and excreted through the kidneys. And that means that the kidneys are then a common toxicity site because all those metabolites, those breakdown products, are being excreted out through the renal system, out through the kidneys. So kidney and liver damage are really common side effects of drugs. That's why many patients, when they take drugs, a whole variety of drugs, the physicians will order some baseline kidney and liver function tests and then periodically when they're on the medication, they may be getting them as well. Uh, now another thing to remember about drugs when you're trying to learn drugs is that drugs in the same class usually have similar effects and similar toxicity. 
They also have similar names. So as we start to talk about the different types of dogs, I will be looking for the family names and pointing them out to you. Uh, notice that, you know, I don't think there's any way you can remember every drug in the pharmacopoeia. That's just, it's just impossible. So we've got to look for commonalities. It's the only way you can make sense of drugs. So look for the similar effects, the similar toxicities, and the family names. And as we start to talk about those, we will, we will be looking for that. This segment is on calculation. Now before we start to look at the calculation questions, I would request that after I present the problem, you may want to turn off the DVD um, or pause it and then do your calculations. And then I will discuss the answers and at least one or two ways to solve the problem. Please, for your best learning, don't just rush into the solution. Take the time to do the problem yourself. You will, are likely to get a few calculation questions on NCLEX. Once in a while, somebody gets through without calculations, but they have recently increased the amount of pharmacology on the exam and that would mean that there will be more calculation questions as well. So do yourself a favor and really solve the problems. Make sure you know how to do that. So the first problem we're going to look at. An adult is to receive 1,000 milliliters of dextrose 5% in water with 40 milli equivalents of KCL in eight hours. The drop factor is 12 drops per milliliter. At what rate should the nurse set the IV? And you have your four answers there. So now take a few moments and solve the problem. Let's take a look at the solution. Hopefully your answer was 25 drops per minute. Now, there are a couple of ways to solve this. Let me present to you first my favorite way and then we'll talk about another way. My personal favorite way is to get to milliliters per hour or cc's per hour. So I would take the thousand cc's divided by eight hours and that's 125 an hour. Then you will divide that, put 125 per hour over 60 minutes in an hour times the drop factor, which in this question was 12 drops per cc or per milliliter. Then you simply do your math. Um, I like to reduce so I have little numbers to deal with. So 12 goes into 65 times. And then 125 divided by 5 is easy. That's 25. Now this is my preferred way to do it. You could just as easily take 1,000 milliliters and put it over 8 times 60 and then multiply by the drop factor. You would come out with the same result. Now, I like small numbers. On the exam, you can use the drop-down calculator. So there is a drop-down calculator on the computer and you may use it to solve the problem. What I would suggest that you do is set it up by, so that, right, make some notes on your, <coughs> excuse me, make some notes on your um, dry erase board so that you know how to set it up. If you want to do the math part, the arithmetic part on the calculator, that's fine. Now don't even think of bringing your own handheld calculators in because you may not do that. You can only use the drop-down calculator on the computer if you wish to do so. Let's look at another question. The patient consumes the following. Four ounces of water, six ounces of orange juice, ten ounces of ginger ale, 300 milliliters of apple juice, and five ounces of water. How many milliliters should the nurse record on the intake sheet? And this is one of those kind of questions where you actually have to write down the milliliters rather than having four choices. So I'm going to give you a moment to solve the problem. Again, you may want to pause the DVD. All right, now. The correct answer to the problem is 1,050 or 1050 milliliters. 
Now remember the magic number here is 30 milliliters per ounce or 30 cc's per ounce. So you take each of those, four ounces times 30 is 120, six ounces times 30 was 180, 10 ounces times 30 is 300. We already have 300 milliliters, don't forget that. And five times 30 is 150 and you add them all up and you can come to 1050. Now there's a shorter way to do that. You could say four and six is 10 and 10 is 20 and five is 25. So 25 times 30 is 750 and you had 300 already recorded in milliliters. So your total is 1050. It really doesn't matter whether you do it the fast way or the slow way as long as you come up with the correct answer. There's at least two or three ways to solve every single math problem that you're going to see. Let's look at another one. The order is for 50 milligrams of meperidine IM. Available on the unit is meperidine 75 milligrams per milliliter. How much should the nurse administer? And you have your four choices. So pause the machine and do your calculations. And your correct answer is 0.66 or 0.67 when you round up with that milliliters. This is a basic desired over half times quantity or volume. We desired 50 milligrams, we had 75, and don't forget the quantity or volume was one milliliter. So you can simply divide 50 by 75. Another way some of you probably looked at it and said 25 goes into 50 two times, 25 goes into 75 three times, that's two thirds or 0.67. Great. Uh, you came up with the correct answer, congratulations. Next problem, a 60 kilogram adult is to receive Hyzid 5 milligrams per kilogram PO divided into three doses. If each Hyzid tablet contains 50 milligrams, how many tablets should you administer per dose? And you have your list of answers there. So pause the machine and do your calculations. The correct answer is two tablets per dose. Now let me show you how you solve that problem. The patient had weighed 60 kilograms and we were to administer five milligrams per kilogram. So that meant that the daily dose was 300 milligrams. It was to be divided into three doses. So that would be 100 milligrams per dose. Now we know that there are 50 milligrams in a tablet. So some of you can already do that in your head, but this then you set it up as desired over half. You want to give 100, you have 50 per one tablet, so that means that you would administer two tablets. Now this is an example of a question where it's not hard, but there are several steps to the question. So as you are doing this kind of question, make sure that you just do it in a step-by-step -step format. And if you do it step-by-step, -step, you're going to get it right. All right, next question. A child weighing 50 pounds must receive uh, Ritalin therapy. Which dose is best if the recommended optimum daily dose is two milligrams per kilogram PO? and you have your four responses. So pause the machine and do your calculations. The correct answer is 45 milligrams. Now this one has several steps to the problem. We were told that the child weighed 50 pounds and then we had to give two milligrams per kilogram. So the first thing we had to do was convert the weight from pounds to kilos. And the magic number here is 2.2. Remember there are 2.2 pounds in one kilogram. So when we do that division, we divide 50 by 2.2. The child weighs 22.7 kilos. 
and we were told in the problem that it was, there were to be administered 2 milligrams per kilogram. So that comes up to 45.4. And in your question, the correct answer was number 2, which is 45. All right, let's go to the next question. If mintazol suspension contains 500 milligrams per 5 milliliters, and a 110 pound person is to receive a 25 milligram per kilogram dose. How many milliliters should be administered? And you have your list of answers. So pause the machine and do your calculations. The correct answer is number two, 12.5 milliliters. Now let's look at how we got that answer. First we had to convert pounds to kilograms because we were given dosage per kilograms. So the person weighed 110 pounds divided by 2.2 is 50 kilograms. So the person weighs 50 kilograms. Then it's 50 kilograms times 25 milligrams per kilogram. So the total dose is 1,250 milligrams. Now we do desired over half times volume. So 1,250 milligrams is desired. We have 500 milligrams in 5 milliliters, which is about a teaspoon actually. But there's 500 milligrams in 5 milliliters. Now you can do your reduction or your division. Uh, you could reduce this one even further. Um, 25 goes into there five times, goes into here two. So you could end up as simple as five over two times five. But however you reduce it, or if you don't reduce it, if you use a calculator and just divide with that, remember it's desired over half times quantity. If you didn't, if you came up with two and a half milliliters, you forgot to multiply by five milliliters. So you came up with two and a half here times five milliliters, which is the volume. So the amount that you would administer is 12.5 milliliters. And I have another problem for you, one more. Vincristin or Oncovin is ordered for a child with a body surface area of 0.6 square meters. The recommended dose is 1.5 milligrams per square meter IV weekly. How many milligrams should the nurse administer? And you see your list of answers there. So pause the button and uh, solve your problem. The correct answer is 0 0.9 milligrams. Now, some of you get all panicky about this because you saw the word up here, body surface area, and you said, oh my, do I have to calculate BSA? No, they gave it to you. So all you have to do is say that the patient had 0 0.6 meters, square meters of body surface area, and you were to give one and a half milligrams per square meter. So it's a simple one and a half times 0.6 ends up with 0.9 milligrams is the desired dose. It's the same way you would calculate it if it were milligrams per kilogram, except that the reference here was square meters. Now these are examples of some of the types of calculation questions I think you could expect on NCLEX. It is not unusual for someone to have two, three, four, questions, even five calculation questions on NCLEX. So you really need to be able to do some calculations. This segment is on antimicrobials. In other words, drugs that kill organisms. There are some general rules when we're administering antimicrobials. One, usually the um, there will be a culture before starting it. So uh, whether it's a throat culture, a urine culture, a wound culture, it's best to culture before starting the antimicrobial. Uh, if the physician has chosen an inappropriate antimicrobial, the culture will tell us, and then it could be changed. 
Antimicrobials are best given at regular intervals. That means if it's ordered QID four times a day, it would be given at six hour intervals. If it's ordered TID, it would be given at eight hour intervals and so forth. A couple other things to think about when administering antimicrobials. Check for superimposed infections. Uh, you may, while well yourself, have taken um, a drug like tetracycline, for instance, and then ended up with a, a yeast infection. Uh, this is quite common because the antimicrobial kills the organisms in the GI tract. And then you may, and not only the GI tract, but also in the vagina, for instance, then you get a superimposed infection. Diarrhea is very common with antimicrobials because it kills the organisms in the GI tract. Uh, and then you get a, a imbalance of the organisms. Yeah, another thing that you must always teach the patient is to take all of the medications. Oftentimes patients will say, well, I feel better. Why can't I just stop right now? I don't like the diarrhea. I don't like the itching or the yeast infection. The problem is if they stop too soon, then this sets it up so that they can develop antibiotic resistant organisms. So they should always take all of the medication. Now we're going to start by looking at several different classifications and the first group are the aminoglycosides. These are mycins. All of your mycins except erythromycin really fall into this category. Things like streptomycin, gentamicin, now, usually we're giving these drugs IV because they are not systemically absorbed when given by mouth. If they're given by, by mouth, they are given for bowel disinfection. So if you're doing a bowel prep before surgery, the patient might be getting neomycin or canamycin by mouth, and that would kill the organisms in the bowel. But they would not do any good for a systemic infection. Systemic infection has got to be given either IV or IM. Now, there are two major side effects you should know about with aminoglycosides. Eighth cranial nerve or hearing loss. And then also nephrotoxicity, kidney toxicity. Now, notice how similar the shapes are of the ear and the kidney, that may be a memory tool for you to remember that if a drug has auditory side effects or eighth cranial nerve side effects, it usually has renal side effects as well. Uh, another possible side effect is neuromuscular blockade, although this is less frequently asked on exams. When patients are getting aminoglycosides, they need peaks and troughs. So blood will be drawn uh, just before a dose of medication is given. And then they will draw blood again after the medication. So if it's given IV, the, dr the drug will be, dr uh, the, the peak will be drawn at about 30 minutes to an hour after the medication. Uh, if it's given IM, it would be a good hour after the administration of the medication. And this is to make sure that the levels are high enough but not too high to cause uh, toxicity. Let's look at a question. An adult has been receiving gentamicin IV every eight hours for several days. Which finding, if present, is most suggestive of an adverse reaction to the drug? A WBC of 8,000, tinnitus, itching, or nasal stuffiness? Gentamicin? The side effect that would be most suggestive is tinnitus, eighth cranial nerve damage. Now, could they possibly have itching? Maybe, but eighth cranial nerve damage is the most common side effect. So tinnitus or ringing in the ears would be something you'd want to be sure to report to the RN or to the physician. Another class of antimicrobials are penicillins. And these are used to treat all kinds of infections, both gram-positive and negative, things like gonorrhea, meningitis, pneumococcal pneumonia, streptococcus, so the things like strep throats, uh, rheumatic fever, treponema. The treponema pallidum is what causes syphilis. 
So there's a whole variety of infections. Penicillin and its various forms can be used to treat that. Now, when we talk about penicillins, there are a lot of kinds of penicillins and they all end in psyllin. One of the common reactions you must assess for with penicillin is allergic reactions and even anaphylaxis. In the United States, we do not routinely skin test before administering penicillin. But you should always ask the patient, are you allergic to penicillin? So always ask that question, are you allergic to penicillin? If the patient, ha and then if they say yes, ask them to describe the reaction. If they've had a reaction to penicillin, then um, you describe that for the physician and sometimes they will order a skin test to see if they are truly allergic to penicillin because sometimes uh, a skin rash might simply be a part of the disease process that was being treated. And things like diarrhea, we do not count as allergic reactions. Those are just really expected kinds of side effects. Now, usually um, when penicillin is given by mouth, there is a very much likelihood that they could end up with either nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Diarrhea is very common when you give it by mouth. Many times uh, they will ask to give oral forms on an empty stomach. And this isn't 100% true, but frequently they ask that. Probenicid is a drug that is occasionally ordered to increase the blood levels of penicillin, and that's probably just a nice piece of information to have. Let's look at a question. An infant has been prescribed amoxicillin suspension for otitis media. Now, it's amoxicillin. You know it's in the penicillin family. What should the nurse tell the infant's parents? One, when your child's temperature has been normal for three days, discontinue the medicine. Two, discard any unused medication. Three, if your child's ear infection recurs, administer any leftover medication you have. Four, give your child all of the medication in the bottle. And the correct answer is number four. Give your child all of the medication in the bottle. Uh, there's no, they should not stop until it's all been given unless the doctor so directs them. There should be no unused medication, so they shouldn't discard it. By the way, suspensions are only good for about 10 days to two weeks so that some parents say, well, I'll just put the extra in the refrigerator. Um, and then if he gets another ear infection, I'll have some. Forget it. First off, you've not adequately treated the first one if you don't give them all the medication. And secondly, the medicine wouldn't be any good anyway because it is outdated and uh, the suspensions become outdated very quickly. Another type of antimicrobial that we want to look at are the cephalosporins. Uh, most of these have ceph or kef in their name. So you see things that the CEPH is usually in the uh, generic name, and it's either PH or F. And then there's KEF uh, in the trade name in many of these kinds of cephalosporins. These are used for a lot of the same conditions that penicillin might be used for. The key thing to recall on this is that there is a cross allergy to penicillin. About 25% of people that are allergic to penicillin will also be allergic to cephalosporins. So that means you must always ask, are you allergic to penicillin? And if they are, get a description of their allergic reaction and then notify the charge nurse or the physician. Another toxicity that's possible is renal toxicity. Now let's look at a question. Cephalexin or Keflex, 250 milligrams PO, Q6 hours, is ordered for an adult. The nurse notes that the client's history indicates an allergy to penicillin. What is the most appropriate initial action for the nurse to take? One, notify the physician. Two, observe the client carefully after giving the medication. Three, administer Keflex at 12-hour intervals instead of 6-hour intervals. Or four, ask the client to describe the reaction. So we are asked for the most appropriate initial action 
which would be number f ask the client to describe the reaction. Then you will give this information to the physician and the physician will make the decision on whether the risk of a cross allergic reaction is justified. In other words, whether the benefit from the medication outweighs the possible risk of an allergic reaction. That would be a medical decision to be made, but you would hold the medication until the physician had been notified. Now, another group of drugs are erythromycins. Even though these sound like those aminoglycosides, the erythromycins are in a separate category. So some of these drugs have the term ILO in them. Um, not all of them, but some of them have ILO in their generic or trade names. These erythromycins are frequently given to patients allergic to penicillin. They also are given for some specific diseases like Legionnaire's disease. Now this is a respiratory pneumonia-like thing um, that actually the organism grows in air conditioning ducts. Uh, we've had outbreaks in hotels and on um, cruise ships for of Legionnaire's disease. Mycoplasma is another one that we commonly use erythromycins for. Um, so mycoplasma infections. Chlamydia uh, is one. Borrelia, these are things that can cause some of your tick-borne diseases. Flus, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, which is, can cause um, ulcers, stomach ulcers. Erythromycin is typically given in enteric coated tablets. So this is usually a, a, a hard coating around it, which means that it will not dissolve in the acid of the stomach, but rather in the alkaline environment of the small bowel. You would never cut or crush an enteric coated tablet. If you do, then uh, it's, that no longer has that protective coating. And this is very important with erythromycin because acid uh, destroys it. It needs to be absorbed in an um, alkaline medium. So you don't want to give this drug with acids uh, and it's best given on an empty stomach so it will move right quickly out of the stomach into the small bowel where we've got an alkaline environment. Let's look at a question. Erythromycin PO six hours, um, every six hours, is prescribed for an adult, which must be included in the nurse's instruction about taking this medication. One, take on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. Two, take with meals and at bedtime with a snack. Three, do not go out in the sun while taking this medication. Or four, stop taking the medication when the symptoms are relieved. So the one that is essential, that, which must be given when taking the medication, is to one, take it on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. Another type of antimicrobial that we want to look at are the tetracyclines. And these are used to treat rickettsial infections like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, mycoplasma infections, chlamydia, um, even sometimes to treat acne. Uh, in that case, it would be given on a long-term basis. Now, there's a couple of, of things to recall. We don't give anything with minerals in it, like no milk products, and we don't want metals, zinc or iron, because those reduce the absorption of tetracyclines. Tetracyclines cause photosensitivity, so that's why the, uh, the uh, sun umbrella or parasol there uh, to protect against the sun. So you tell patients don't go out in the sun when you're taking tetracyclines. They can also cause gray teeth syndrome in children. So we don't give tetracycline to children less than about eight years of age. If we do, their second teeth will come in gray. So we prefer not uh, to do that. So remember, stay out of the sun. Don't give it to small children or women in the third trimester of pregnancy because that can also cause gray tooth syndrome in their children. And we don't give uh, milk products or zinc or iron uh, to patients that are t at the same time that they're taking the tetracycline. Another category of antimicrobials are the quinolones. 
These are oftentimes used for UTIs, but they can be used for some other things as well. Um, so these are the Floxacins. So they're, that's their family name, Floxacin. And they are used um, pretty much for not only UTIs, but some of the systemic infections. And I think that's probably what you need to know about those. Just recognize the Floxacins as quinolones. Sulfonamids are one that you need to know a few more things about. Sulfonamids are sulfa drugs, so you often see sulfa in some of the name, either generic, sometimes trade name as well. Um, you may also see Gantt. There's a number of trade names that have the term Gantt in them. These are used a great deal for urinary tract infections. They can also be used for bowel infections like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and sometimes even as part of a bowel prep because they will kill organisms in the GI tract. They can cause skin rashes quite frequently. There's a real concern about kidney stones. Uh, so we encourage fluids. On your slide you saw there was a glass of water uh, there and that means that you push fluids push fluids to help reduce the likelihood of kidney stones. So it will just flush that right out of the system. Um, they may get GI distress with this and they are very, very sensitive to the sunshine. So stay out of the sun and drink lots of fluids when you're taking sulfa drugs. So let's see, we had a couple drugs you stay out of the sun. We had tetracycline and sulfa drugs that you must stay out of the sunshine. Let's look at a question. Sulfasuxazole or Gantrosin 500 milligrams tablets 2 PO QID is ordered for an adult who has a urinary tract infection. The nurse instructs the patient to take the tablets with a full glass of water and to drink additional fluids during the day. What is the primary reason for the nurse's instruction? One, fluid intake increases absorption of the medication. Two, drinking fluids will help to prevent stone formation. Three, fluid intake will help to reduce fever associated with a urinary tract infection. Or four, fluid makes the medication act more quickly. And the correct answer is number two, drinking fluids will help to prevent stone formation. Another type of antimicrobials I want us to look at are the anti-tubercular drugs. Now, we've already talked about streptomycin, which is frequently used to treat tuberculosis. So I want to talk about some of the others. INH, or isoniazid, is given both in the prophylaxis and the treatment of active TB. So someone with skin test positive, x-ray negative, they'll be placed on INH, as well as someone who has active tuberculosis. The two major side effects you have to remember are liver toxicity, and peripheral neuritis. Now, to monitor for liver toxicity, they will be monitoring liver function tests. And to, to prevent peripheral neuritis, they will give vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine. Uh, now, some of the drugs actually have it in the tablets, and others uh, it will be given as a separate tablet. But those two questions about liver toxicity and peripheral neuritis we know have been on NCLEX questions about INH. Another drug sometimes used is PAS, para-amino salicylate. That always sounds to me like aspirin, and so it's easy for me to remember GI side effects. This one is given with meals. The others are given on an empty stomach, but PAS is given with meals. Rifampin turns body fluids red-orange. So rifampin turns body fluids red-orange. Now it can also affect the action of a lot of drugs, including inactivating birth control pills. By the way, your penicillin family drugs will do that too. A lot of your antimicrobials will make the birth control pills less effective. Another drug that's used to treat tuberculosis is ethambutol. Ethambutol has eye side effects, optic neuritis and red-green color blindness. It can also elevate the uric acid and cause gout. So wow, 
Drugs used to treat tuberculosis can cause a whole series of side effects, can't they? But then tuberculosis kills. Um, so it's usually justified to try those combinations of drugs. Another category of drugs we want to look at are antiviral agents. These are easy to pick out because their family names have VIR in them. Almost all of them have VIR somewhere in the generic or trade name or both. These are used to treat such things as herpes simplex 1 and 2, herpes simplex 1 being fever blisters, herpes simplex 2 being genital herpes. It doesn't cure herpes, but it certainly does prevent, um, it, well, it doesn't prevent anything. It shortens the, the length of the episode and reduces the frequency of uh, episodes. But it does not cure herpes and it does not prevent transmission. So if someone is taking a cyclovir for genital herpes, they are still communicable and they could still transmit the disease to their sexual partners. That's an important part of teaching about these drugs. Now there are some antiretroviral drugs and these are drugs that are used to treat HIV. So none of these drugs, and we're going to talk about several categories of drugs here, none of them cure HIV and none of them prevent completely the transmission of the disease. What they do is they slow its progress. They inhibit the replication of the virus and slow the progress. Notice that these drugs also, most of them have VI or V something, uh, VIR in generic or trade names. And a major side effect of these drugs is going to be bone marrow suppression. So while they're used to treat a, a potentially fatal illness, they have potentially fatal side effects if, the, if their dosage is too high. Another group of antiretroviral drugs are the non-nucleoside analogs. And again, they do not cure AIDS. They just slow the uh, replication of the virus. You can also recognize these with VIRs. They need to be given with at least one other antiviral and sometimes several to prevent resistance. Um, this, like many antimicrobials, increase, or decreases the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. And the third category of antiretroviral drugs that are used to treat AIDS that I want to talk about are the protease inhibitors. And again, you can see they are VIRs. Again, they do not um, cure it and they don't uh, prevent transmission. They just slow the progress of this. They, these have a lot of interaction with other drugs, so we have to be very cautious, particularly about the use of things like over-the-counter drugs. These are best given with food. Now, there's another category, and the last category of antimicrobials I'm going to talk about, and these are antifungals, nystatin or mycostatin. These are used for yeast infections. Now, these particular products are given very often for vaginal infections. So, we have PO forms and we have vaginal suppositories. Infants who would get thrush during birth can get, take the PO form of the nystatin. Uh, and it cures uh, their fungal infection. This segment is on drugs affecting the central nervous system. The first thing I want to talk about are local anesthetics. Now remember, canes block pain. So we're talking about xylocaine, novocaine, carbocaine, all the different types of canes. Now it's interesting to note that when a local anesthetic is given, the first thing that happens is that the skin veins dilate and there's a feeling of warmth. Then the patient loses the sense of temperature, the sense of pain, touch, and motion in that order. And when the medication wears off, it comes back in opposite. So motion comes back first, then touch, then pain, then uh, temperature sense uh, returns. Another thing that you might want to note on is that sometimes local anesthetics are given with vasoconstrictors like epinephrine. This slows the absorption, enhances the action, 
and prolongs the action of local anesthetics. I want us to take a little look at regional anesthetics and we really need to know the difference between epidural and spinal anesthetic. If you take a look at the picture here, an epidural does not puncture the dura. This blue line in here is the dura. Underneath that is cerebral spinal fluid. So the epidural does not puncture the dura. There is no loss of cerebral spinal fluid. This patient is not at particular risk for spinal headache. However, with a spinal anesthetic, the needle punctures the dura. There is loss of cerebral spinal fluid. This puts the patient at risk for spinal headache. So they need to be flat to reduce the likelihood of spinal headache. And we usually encourage fluids to help remanufacture the cerebral spinal fluid. I want us now to talk a little bit about non-narcotic analgesics. These are drugs like salicylates, the aspirin family of drugs, NSAIDs, which include things like ibuprofen and anything made out of ibuprofen, uh, Motrin, Advil, and acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. Notice that all three of these types of non-narcotic analgesics are analgesic and antipyretic. Note that the salicylates and the NSAIDs are also anticoagulant and anti-inflammatory. So that means that salicylates and NSAIDs are more likely to cause bleeding. They're also more effective when there's inflammation. So patients who have arthritis, for instance, will tell you that they get much more relief from ibuprofen than they do from Tylenol because ibuprofen is more anti-inflammatory effect. Now, these effects, we're, we're now looking at adverse reactions. And as we're talking about adverse reactions, we need to think in terms of, of what effects they have. So bleeding, which anticoagulant could be a, a, a good effect if you were taking a, a, an aspirin to keep the stroke away. But it also is a, an adverse effect. So aspirin and NSAIDs have bleeding and they have GI side effects. You put the two together, you have bleeding ulcers. Acetaminophen, the biggie thing I want us to think about is liver damage. NSAIDs can affect the liver a bit, but uh, the acetaminophen is far worse on that. Kidney damage is more likely to occur with aspirin and NSAIDs. And don't forget the tinnitus or ringing in the ears that they often ask about that occurs with too much aspirin. Let's look at a question. An adult has been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Sufficoxib or Celebrax is ordered. The next day she calls the clinic and says her joints still hurt. What is the best response for the nurse to make? Choice one, it may take, it may take several days for maximum effects. Choice two, take aspirin with the Celebrax. It will enhance the action. Choice three, you should have pain relief by now. Come in and see the physician. Or choice four, take an additional pill each day. Now the correct answer is number one. It may take several days for maximum effects. Cephacoxib or Celebrax is uh, an NSAID type drug used a lot for the treatment of arthritis. A related drug, something like that, Vioxx, has been taken off the market because of some cardiac effects that it has. Now, in those answer choices on this question, did you notice that a couple of the answers, answers number two and four, the nurse was actually prescribing. You were saying, take aspirin with a Celebrax or take an additional pill each day. That is not the role of the LPN. So you could eliminate those answers even if you knew nothing about the drug simply because they were inappropriate for the LPN to do. Another uh, drug that I want us to look at is Imatrex, uh, Sumatriptan, and this is often used for migraine headaches. This can be given as a uh, Sub-Q injection. There are also other forms uh, becoming available in this. Now, 
Um, we teach patients to administer their injection or take their medication at the onset of a migraine headache before it gets uh, extremely uh, unbearable. Now, the slides suggest that you want to avoid tyramine foods. This is just common sense. If the person knows what foods trigger their migraine headache, and tyramine are common, but not for everybody necessarily, but if they know what triggers the headache, we want to teach them to avoid that. So we want to teach them how to recognize what's causing or triggers the headache and to avoid the food, the situation, whatever it is that brings on the migraine headache. Another group of drugs I want us to look at are drugs that are used to treat arthritis. Now I'm pushing the envelope a little bit to call these central nervous drugs, but they are used to control the pain and also the inflammation of arthritis. So aspirin we've talked about, NSAIDs we've talked about. Uh, steroids can be used to treat arthritis. The side effect is Cushing syndrome along with the GI side effects. Antimalarials have been used to treat arthritis, the quinine drugs, and also gold can be used to treat arthritis. Um, gold is safer when it's given by mouth. There is an injectable form, but it causes more side effects. Another um, group of drugs that can be used to treat arthritis are drugs like methotrexate. You think of this as a cancer drug, but what it does is it's immunosuppressive. Now, and that's good if we classify arthritis, uh, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, as an autoimmune disease. Now notice that every one of these drugs used to treat arthritis can cause GI side effects. GI bleeds are very common in arthritics that are being medicated. Another group of drugs that I want us to look at are those used to treat gout. And again, this is pushing the envelope. These are not truly central nervous system drugs, but they are used um, to help with gout, which is an extremely painful disease. Uh, one of the drugs is allopurinol. This is used um, more in long-term prevention, and what it does is it helps uh, to get rid of the uric acid crystals, uh, and that way it will help to prevent those collecting in the uh, joints. Whenever allopurinol is given, you need to push fluids. That's to help push it right on out so it doesn't form kidney stones. Colchizine is another drug that is used to treat um, gout, and this is often used for an acute attack. It can cause diarrhea and vomiting as a side effect. Probenicid or Benamid is also used to treat um, gout. And again, it's usually given in more of the long-term management. It's best given with food. Now I'd like to look at narcotic analgesics. Narcotic analgesics don't take away the source of the pain. What they do is they alter the perception of and the response to pain. They act in the brain and it makes you not care about the pain anymore. So narcotic analgesics are central nervous system drugs so we look to the central nervous system for side effects. So decrease in respirations and I know you know when you give narcotics monitor respirations. And narcotics also decrease alertness, so you must teach patients taking narcotics don't drive uh, because they're not safe behind the wheel. It suppresses cough reflex. It drops vital signs. It can drop blood pressure and pulse. It can slow peristalsis so that narcotine constipates. Narcotics tend to cause constipation. Narcotics also constrict the pupils. Narcotics um, tend to cause vomiting, in part because of the slowing of peristalsis, in part because of the effect on the brain. Narcotics can cause urinary retention. Narcotics raise intracranial pressure, so they're not usually given for people with head injuries and craniotomies. With all those side effects, who'd want to take a narcotic? Well, anybody with severe pain might want to because it does make you not care about the pain. Remember that narcotics potentiate other central nervous system drugs 
and have an addictive potential. So um, we must teach the patient when you are taking a narcotic, no alcohol. And that's really important to do in discharge teaching for someone that's going home from the hospital site. Alcohol, what's safe alcohol? With safe narcotics, you combine the two, it simply is not safe. Now, when we take a look at some of these narcotic analgesic equivalents, you notice that the dosages are really all over the place. Dilated, the therapeutic dose is maybe one and a half milligrams given IM, and that's the same effectiveness as 75 or 100 milligrams of Demerol, which is meparidine. The lesson you want to take away with this is that you would never substitute one narcotic for another dose for dose. This simply is totally inappropriate. Now notice also that by mouth it takes a lot higher dosage to get the same therapeutic effect as a lower dose is given IM or IV. Now, I also wanted us to mention a little bit about patient-controlled analgesia. And this is um, where the patient actually pushes this little button, and then there is a syringe full of narcotic in here. When the patient pushes the button, that will release the narcotic into the IV line. Now, the registered nurse is usually the one that sets the dose and frequency limits. And, so, and that's as ordered by the physician. Frequently, there is a lockout period or frequency limit of 10 to 15 minutes. And that means if the patient pushes the button at 10 and gets their medication, if they push it at, and let's say we have a 15 minute lockout period, they push it at 10, 10, nothing happens. They push it at 1015, they'll get their medication. As an LPN, it is your job to assess the patient for pain, pain relief, and then to monitor for side effects, including monitoring vital signs. Now, when patients use PCAs, say postoperatively, or even sometimes in patients with um, cancer and intractable pain, Usually, we, the studies show us that they have less total analgesia and they're happier about it. They, they have control over when they're going to get their medication uh, and they, therefore, they give the medication to themselves when the pain starts to build. They don't wait until it's impossible and they need less total medication. Another drug I want us to look at are the narcotic antagonists. So if we talked about narcotics, we ought to talk about what to do if you get an overdose of narcotics. Now the narcotic antagonists, drugs like Narcan or Naloxone. Now look at Narcan, narc, narcotic, antagonist. It tells you exactly what it does. Isn't that a wonderful drug? Now this is used to treat respiratory depression that's been brought on by uh, an overdose or too much narcotics, so opiate-induced respiratory depression. There are two things I think you need to remember. It causes withdrawal in addicted people, and it's very quick-acting. That means it is short-acting. Any drug that is rapid-acting is apt to be short-acting. What naloxone does is block the opiate receptors. And so the patient would, of course, if they were an addict, go into withdrawal because it, the opiate receptors are not picking up the narcotics. That also means that if the patient was getting the opiate for pain medication and got overdosed on it, that when you give them the Narcan, their pain's going to come back because you're blocking the opiate receptors in the brain. But a breathing patient in pain is better than a pain-free, non-breathing patient. Let's look at a question. An adult is on call for the operating room. The preoperative medication order is from a paradine, 100 milligrams IM, and atropine, 0.4 milligrams IM. The operating room calls at 11 AM to request the client be medicated. The client last received 75 milligrams of meparidine for pain at 10 AM. 
What is the most appropriate action for the nurse at this time? Choice one, give the pre-op medication as ordered. Choice two, give half the dose of meperidine and all of the atropine. Three, check with the anesthesiologist before administering the medication. Or choice four, give both the meperidine and atropine as ordered. Well, if you look at the question, the problem is that Demerol is ordered and they just received Demerol an hour ago. So the thing that you have to do is choice number three. Check with the anesthesiologist before administering the medication. You do not want to overdose with narcotic. It is not up to you to decide to give a lower dose, to give only the atropine. This choice is a medical decision. So you would either notify the charge nurse or the physician and get direction on that. Another group of drugs I want us to look at are sedatives hypnotics. And there are several categories of these. The barbiturates, they're easy to recognize. Their family name is barbitol, phenobarbital, cecobarbital, amabarbital, they're all barbitols. The non-benzodiazepines, these are a group of drugs that kind of don't fit into some other category. Things like peraldehyde and chlorohydrate. Probably not the most commonly asked on NCLEX. And then the benzodiazepines. These would be drugs that I think you really need to know about. Things like diazepam, which is Valium. Uh, but notice they've all got the PAM in their name or AM in their name. So they're rather easy to identify. Sometimes we call benzodiazepines anti-anxiety drugs. Now, if these are CNS depressants, then you know that one of the side effects will be drowsiness um, and respiratory depression. Now, another thing I think we need to know about these drugs is that there is a cross, these are, have an addictive potential, and there is also a cross addiction with uh, narcotics and alcohol. So that if someone is dependent on um, or fetobarbital, then it would be much easier for them um, to be addicted to another drug. If they are addicted to phenobarb, and you are giving pain medication, they may need a higher dose of pain medication, for instance. If they're addicted to alcohol and you're giving them phenobarbital, they need a higher dose of phenobarbital to get the same results because this cross-addiction exists. Let's look at a question. A man living in a long-term care facility is having difficulty sleeping since his wife died a few weeks ago. Triazolam or Halcyon 0.25 milligram tablets one or two is ordered. The client asks the nurse to leave the medication beside the bed, saying he will take it later when he is ready to sleep. What is the best nursing action? One, leave both pills at the bedside. Two, leave one pill at the bedside. Three, tell the client to call the nurse when he is ready to go to sleep. Or four, tell the client to take the medication now or not at all. And the correct answer is number three. You tell the client to call the nurse when he's ready to go to sleep. First off, we said that whenever you give medications, you stay with the patient until they take it. If they're not going to take it, you tell them to call you and you'll bring it back later. Secondly, did you notice some risk factors in here? This man um, is having trouble sleeping since his wife died. Now, we would need to be a little bit concerned because sometimes people who are depressed will hoard medication. And then when they have enough pills, they will attempt to commit suicide. And sometimes they're successful. So this put in kind of a, a double risk type thing for us. Hopefully you pick that up. Another group of drugs are the anticonvulsants, and you'll notice that some of these overlap the ones we just talked about, the benzodiazepines, the Valium, and then carbamazepine is really in that same general family, Tagretol. These are two drugs that are frequently used to treat seizure disorders and epilepsy. 
Other drugs used to treat epilepsy, I think you absolutely must know Dilantin, the high Dantoans. And they often ask about the side effects of Dilantin. And these include things like hyperplasia of the gums or overgrowth of the gums. You actually can't totally prevent it, but you can make it less obnoxious by good mouth care. They will get blood tests to pick up uh, not only changes in the CBC, but also kidney and liver function. And you must teach the patient and their family that alcohol reduces the effectiveness of Dilantin. So you don't want people taking Dilantin to take elixirs because that means that it has alcohol as a base or to drink alcohol. The therapeutic serum levels are nice to know as well because sometimes uh, they might ask that these patients will be getting regular blood levels and we want 10 to 20 micrograms um, per milliliter is the therapeutic dose. If it's too low, the dose of Dilantin may be raised. If it's too high, the dose may be lowered. Every one of those drugs that are used to treat seizures are CNS depressants. Now, the barbiturates, um, phenobarbital, that was another category of those sedative hypnotics um, that we just talked about a few moments ago. They can also be used to treat uh, seizures, especially in children. We see a lot of phenobarbital for seizures. Another group of drugs in the central nervous system are the anti-Parkinsonian agents. Now, remember in Parkinson's disease, the patients don't have enough dopamine so if the primary problem here is not enough dopamine, then we would give drugs that increase dopamine, like levodopa or carbidopa. They also tend to end up with more acetylcholine, and they drool a lot. So we give them anticholinergic drugs like cogentin to help with the drooling and secretions. Now remember that you don't want to give cogentin to someone with glaucoma or BPH because it could aggravate those conditions. A question. A 72-year-old who has Parkinson's disease is started on cogentin 0.5 milligrams PO daily. Which nursing action is most essential? One, monitor blood pressure and pulse. Two, encourage cold beverages and hard candies. Three, observe for rashes. Or four, monitor stools for fluid loss. And the correct answer is number one, monitor blood pressure and pulse because cogentin is anticholinergic. And if it's anticholinergic, it acts more like adrenergic and it can raise blood pressure and pulse. Now, answer number two has some truth to it because it does dry secretions. However, vital signs are more important than a dry mouth. So number one is the most essential. Now, we also want to look at some drugs that affect the autonomic nervous system. And the both, we have the two branches to it. You recall the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. There's actually a longer discussion of the autonomic nervous system in the section on the nervous, the neurosensory um, DVD in this series. But the sympathetic system, you remember, is the fight and flight system. It is called adrenergic because the neurotransmitter is adrenaline. This is your emergency response system that raises blood pressure and pulse and slows peristalsis. Now, the parasympathetic system acts opposite to it. It is called cholinergic because the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. But you can remember that the cholinergic system actually promotes colon function. It promotes peristalsis. So the parasympathetic slows heart rate and blood pressure and promotes digestion. Now, if you have those thoughts in mind, you can look at the categories of drugs related to the autonomic nervous system. Now, adrenergic drugs are adrenaline-like drugs. 
A drug like epinephrine can be used to treat patients who are in shock. A drug like the theophylline, aminophylline, or epinephrine can be used to treat bronchospasm because it dilates the bronchioles. Now, the major side effect of these drugs is tachycardia. So the biggie, biggie one is tachycardia. It could also cause urinary retention and nausea and vomiting because they slow peristalsis. We had the adrenergic drugs. We also have adrenergic blockers. These are drugs that block the sympathetic nervous system and so drop blood pressure. Beta blockers act on the beta adrenergic fibers and these are all allals. And the alpha blockers act on the alpha adrenergic fibers and these are zosins. Both of these categories of drugs can be used to drop blood pressure, so they can be used as antihypertensives. Now, a drug like Tamoptic can be used to decrease intraocular pressure, and those are given as eye drops usually. Cholinergic drugs, this acts to promote the parasympathetic nervous system can be used to treat conditions like myasthenia gravis, where we have a deficiency in those cholinergic, um, the uptake of, the co of uh, acetylcholine. So midylase, prostigmine, that's probably the biggie one to remember is prostigmine. Mestinone, tensilon is another one. This is the diagnostic test for myasthenia gravis. A drug called urocholine can be used to treat both urinary retention and abdominal distension. Someone say post-op whose bowel sounds have not returned. Giving urocholine can stimulate the return of those bowel sounds. And on the last of those autonomic nervous system related drugs are the anticholinergics. These are the ones that are going to dry secretions. So these are given oftentimes preoperatively. Uh, we can give cogentin, an anticholinergic, uh, to treat some of the drooling effects of Parkinson's disease. It can be used in some types of dysrhythmia, uh, but we have to be very cautious about that. Um, because one of the contraindications is also an unstable heart because an anticholinergic is going to increase the heart rate. And it can also raise uh, the intraocular pressure. So glaucoma and um, tachycardia rapid heartbeats are contraindications. And the side effects are red, hot, dry, blind, mad. So they get red and warm, so flushed dry, dry secretions. They get blurred vision, um, the blindness. They aren't truly blind, but they do have blurred vision. And the mad means confused or crazy, so that they get rather confused oftentimes. Uh, and they are quite sensitive to light. So red, hot, dry, blind, mad are the major side effects of the anticholinergic drugs. The next segment is on cardiac and renal drugs. And I want us to start out by talking about one of the biggies in cardiac, that's the digitalis, or digoxin, the whole digitalis family of drugs. Digoxin, or digitalis family drugs, slow and strengthen the heartbeat, acting on both the SA and AV nodes. And because it makes the heartbeat more effectively, it increases the blood supply to the organs. Now you might remember that digoxin sometimes starts with a loading dose. If so, it's about double the normal dose for one or two doses to quickly raise the level to therapeutic levels. Uh, then they go on a maintenance dose for the rest of the time that they're on digoxin. Digoxin is a very long-acting drug. It stays in the body a week. So therefore, that's one of the reasons why they frequently ask questions about digoxin toxicity. We need to pick it up quickly uh, because there's still a week's worth of medication in the patient's system. Now, signs of digoxin toxicity. You can have GI-type symptoms. So the patient can get anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. 
Bradycardia is a biggie one. In an adult, remember, you withhold digoxin if the pulse is below 60. 60 you give it, 59 you don't. In infants, we're looking at closer to 100 as the cutoff point. In toddlers, it would be more like 90 as the cutoff point. Uh, other side effects uh, or signs of toxicity include disturbances in green and yellow vision. So if a patient tells you the world looks like pea soup, all green, or that it looks all yellow um, color, then this is a sign of drug toxicity and should be reported to the RN or the physician immediately. Um, don't fool around with this. Report it immediately. Now we check potassium levels. Not because digoxin lowers serum potassium or affects it, because it doesn't. But when you have a low serum potassium, you get digoxin toxicity more quickly. And we frequently give this drug with Lasix, which will lower serum potassium. So we sort of set them up for problems with uh, lowered serum potassium and toxicity. Now I think you should know the therapeutic levels for uh, digoxin. The serum digoxin, we hope, will be about 0.8 to 2.0 nanograms per milliliter. If it gets above 2 or above 2.5, we see toxicity. And uh, so the general rule is hold the medication if the serum dig level is above 2.0 nanograms per milliliter. There is an antidote. It is called digoxin immune. Uh, or digoxin immune FAB, F-A-B, or Digibind. Now, if you saw a drug named Digibind, you would probably figure out that it binds digoxin. Let's look at a question. A 75-year-old was admitted in heart failure. He has been digitalized and is now taking a maintenance dose of digoxin, 0.25 milligrams daily. He is to be discharged soon. Which observation is of most concern to the nurse? One, the client's pulse is 66. Two, the client says he is nauseated and has no appetite. Three, the client says he will take his pill every morning. Or four, the client has lost eight pounds since admission a week ago. And the correct answer is number two. This is a sign of ditch toxicity. The pulse is okay. Taking the pill every morning is fine. Losing that much weight is all right too because as the heart beats more effectively, the fluid that's been accumulating uh, because he was in heart failure is going to leave the system. Another cardiac drug that's essential for us to know is about nitrates and, nit and nitrites and nitrates. Nitroglycerin, in other words. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. It dilates the heart muscles, the coronary vessels. It also dilates cerebral vessels and peripheral vessels. So when it dilates cerebral vessels, this is what gives the headaches that patients frequently get. And when it dilates the peripheral vessels, this is what causes orthostatic hypotension. And the orthostatic hypotension is so severe that you teach the patient uh, when you are taking your nitroglycerin, you sit down or lie down. You do not take it in a standing position because there is a risk that your blood pressure could drop and you could faint. Uh, now, nitroglycerin, uh, most patients with uh, angina get sublingual nitroglycerin, and that means it goes, that's right, under the tongue. And remember the rule, every five minutes times three doses. So they could take it at 10, 10.05, 10, 10.10. 10. If there's not relief in that period of time, it's 911 time. It's time to call the emergency system uh, because either they're having something more severe than their ordinary angina or their medication is outdated. In any event, they need medical care. Uh, nitroglycerin is unstable. It should be in a dark glass container stored in a relatively cool environment, um, but not the refrigerator because that's too humid. It's very, very unstable drug. It also, nitroglycerin comes in pastes and patches. Remember, if you use a, a patch, for instance, you take off one patch before you put on another. 
If you put it on paste, you want to thoroughly cleanse the area when you remove that application. Another drug that can be used for patients with angina are calcium blockers, sometimes called calcium channel blockers. These are drugs like nifedipine. Now, if you saw the name Procardia, you'd know it was a heart drug, wouldn't you? Verapamil. Look at, look at over here. Look at C-A-L-A-N, calcium antagonist. It tells you what it does. Diltiazem is another uh, calcium channel blocker. If you saw the trade name Cardizem, you would certainly know it was a heart drug. These are used to treat angina and also atrial dysrhythmias. Supraventricular means above the ventricles, atrial dysrhythmias. The side effects, like those of nitroglycerin, are hypotension and headache. Uh, so both of these can be used to treat angina, and they both have similar side effects, hypotension and headache. And remember, the calcium blockers are also used as antiarrhythmics uh, and uh, treating particularly people with atrial dysrhythmias. A question for us. Nifedipine procardia is prescribed for an adult who has angina pectoris. Which action is essential for the nurse when the client comes for a checkup? One, take his temperature and pulse. Two, take his blood pressure and pulse. Three, evaluate renal function tests. Or four, evaluate liver function tests. And the correct answer is number two, take blood pressure and pulse because you can get orthostatic hypotension and of course, it's used to treat uh, dysrhythmias, so it can affect the rhythm. Now, this is a whole long list of drugs that are used to treat ventricular dysrhythmias. All of them slow the pulse rate. Now, I want you not to notice lidocaine, which is usually given as an emergency drug. Uh, Bertillium is also usually an emergency drug. The others could be emergency or long-term type of drugs. Um, we talked about phenytoin sodium or dilantin as being an anti-seizure drug, but seizures are abnormal electrical impulses in the brain, and uh, dysrhythmias are abnormal electrical impulses in the heart. So sometimes it's used. It's not a first-line drug. Um, you might see drugs like adenosine or amiodarone being used uh, as antiarrhythmics. Any of these drugs are going to slow the heart rate, so you watch for bradycardia. You, now, drugs like isopril and atropine actually raise, um, blood, raise the heartbeat, so those would be used if you had too much of a good thing in slowing the heart rate, too much bradycardia. Uh, Except for emergencies, we like to give these drugs at equal intervals. And obviously, you would monitor vital signs and ECG. Another group of drugs that affect the rhythm are beta blockers. We mentioned these actually earlier this, uh, in this uh, section on pharmacology. But beta blockers are the OLALs. And they can be used either to lower the heart rate or to drop blood pressure. Frequently used as antihypertensive medication. They are not very good for people who have asthma because they can increase the airway resistance. So since they cause bradycardia, you monitor, blood, monitor heart rate. Since they drop blood pressure, you monitor blood pressure. Now, Opposite acting drugs, the cardiac stimulants, these drugs will raise the heart rate and the blood pressure. Atropine is anticholinergic. It blocks the parasympathetic system, and this gives you the dried mouth and blurred vision because of dilated pupils. Isopril is one that we see in a lot of asthma drugs, for instance. Isopril is an adrenergic drug. It dilates bronchioles, but it also stimulates the heart rate and raises blood pressure. I want us to look also at anticoagulants. Heparin is usually given um, IV. It can also be given sub-Q. 
and it blocks the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Two things you need to remember about it. The antidote is protamine sulfate. That's a must know for NCLEX. And the tests used to um, monitor the effectiveness of heparin are PTT, partial thromboplastin time, and occasionally we still see the clotting time being used. Coumadin or warfarin is given um, orally. It acts at a different point in the clotting cycle. It blocks the production of prothrombin. Thou, thou shalt know the antidote for coumadin is vitamin K. So that's how your memory tool. Um, and the blood test used to monitor the effect of coumadin is PT. And sometimes we look at the INR way of looking at PT. There are a lot of drug interactions with Coumadin. So you don't want patients on Coumadin taking anticoagulants such as aspirin and NSAIDs, uh, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of food problems with Coumadin as well. Foods that are high in vitamin K block the action of Coumadin. Another group of drugs that affect clotting are the antiplatelet drugs. Ticlid uh, is a fairly commonly used drug. We sometimes see this used in people who have sickle cell. Um, if this is an antiplatelet drug and platelets are, are the thrombocytes or clotting uh, cells, obviously the adverse effect, the biggie one, is going to be bleeding. And you wouldn't want to give uh, salicylates because that would um, potentiate the ticlid or the antiplatelet drugs. And you don't want to give too many vitamin K foods because that blocks the action of these drugs. These anticoagulants ought to be discontinued about two weeks before surgery if the patient is to have surgery. Otherwise, they may bleed too much during surgery. Let's look at a question. An adult was admitted with deep vein or thrombosis. He is to be discharged on warfarin 5 milligrams daily. Which statement he makes indicates a need for further instruction? One, I will try to eat the same amount of dark green leafy vegetables every day. Two, I will try to take acetaminophen instead of ibuprofen for my arthritis. Three, I made an appointment to have my teeth pulled. Or four, I will take the Coumadin at the same time each day. And the correct answer is number three. If you're taking an anticoagulant, you don't want to go in and have your teeth pulled. You're going to have to come off from that anticoagulant for a couple of weeks before your teeth can be pulled. The dark green leafy vegetables contain vitamin K, but you should have the same amount on a regular basis. Um, acetaminophen has less effect on the INRs and PTs than does ibuprofen. And uh, taking Coumadin at the same time each day tends to keep the, the levels more stable, so that's appropriate. Thrombolytic drugs, lytic or lysis means breakdown, thrombus is a clot. So thrombolytic drugs actually destroy clots. And these are drugs like alteplase and streptokinase, used primarily to treat uh, some, patient, some heart attacks, some strokes, some pulmonary emboli. Now, the key thing on this, uh, other than bleeding being the major adverse effect, would be that this has to be given relatively soon after the infarct. If it's given for a heart attack, you have a six-hour window. If it's given for a stroke, you have a three-hour window. And then following this, this is administered by the physician, then the patient would be on heparin and later warfarin therapy. A question for us. The nurse is assessing an adult who is receiving cholesteramine or Questram before meals and HS. Which assessment is essential to monitor for adverse effects to the drug? One, ask the client if he has been having fainting spells. Two, monitor blood pressure sitting and lying. Three, evaluate serum glucose levels. Or four, inspect for ecumotic areas. 
And the correct answer is number four, inspect for ecumatic areas. And this is related to Questran. Questran is an anti-lipemic agent that reduces the absorption of fats from the GI tract. And the reason you must check for bleeding is that if it reduces the absorption of fats, it also reduces the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. And one of those is vitamin K, -k, -k, -k which K, -k, -k clots. Now, I think you should also know a little bit about the statins, other anti-lipemic drugs. So the statins, probably the major side effect of those is myalgia, muscle pain. Uh, if the patient tells you that they feel like they've got the flu or like a truck ran over them, report this immediately to the physician because these are signs of uh, serious uh, side effects. Notice that there were fruits and vegetables on the picture, and this is to remind us that patients, when they're on anti-lipemic agents, should also be on a high-fiber, low-fat diet. The pills are not enough. They need to modify their lifestyle as well. Now, I want to talk about a couple of kinds of antihypertensives. The ACE inhibitors, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. These are all prills. I think you should know the beta blockers, which we just talked about a few moments ago. These are all olals, and they are used as antihypertensives. I think it's nice if you know the alpha blockers, which are all zosins, also used to drop blood pressure. Now the other two, the central acting and the vasodilators, if you simply recognize that these are antihypertensives, that's going to be enough for you, I think. Now all of these antihypertensives, by one way, means or another, act to cause peripheral vasodilation, which means that they can all cause orthostatic hypotension as a major side effect. Many of them make patients drowsy or sleepy. Uh, your beta blockers are very well known for that. Uh, so you've got to give the safety kinds of instructions. You also must teach the patients never to abruptly discontinue their antihypertensive medications because their blood pressure may rebound higher than it was before. So if they are to come off from it, it should be with a physician's advice. Now I also wanted to mention a little bit about diuretics. And there are several categories of diuretics. The thiazides, and they all have thiazide in their generic name like hydrochlorothiazide, uh, chlorothiazide. These drugs drop blood pressure. They also have uh, our potassium depleting effect, they drop potassium, and they can lower the serum sodium as well. They can cause gout, just like the loops can cause gout. Lasix, a loop diuretic, acts in the loop of Henle to prevent the reabsorption of potassium and sodium. Uh, so these uh, lower blood pressure, they also can are potassium depleting diuretics. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. This raises the osmotic pressure. It's a high glucose solution. And what it tends to do it, is it pulls the fluid then into the bloodstream and then it goes out through the kidneys. Works very well on the blood brain barrier. So we often use mannitol for people with increased intracranial pressure. Uh, it's used for some other conditions as well. And it can lower the sodium and potassium, but not as dramatically as the thiazides and loops do. Spironolactone is, uh, acts to block uh, the action of aldosterone. So it ends up causing a retention or an increase in serum potassium and a decrease in the sodium. So spironolactone or aldactone is often called a potassium sparing diuretic. 
probably should know which ones cause our potassium depleters and which ones are potassium sparers. Let's look at a question. An adult who has been taking furosemide 40 milligrams daily for several weeks is now complaining of muscle weakness and lethargy. Which test will be of greatest value in assessing the client? Serum electrolytes, urinalysis, serum creatinine, or AST and APT? And the answer is number one, serum electrolytes because of the loss of potassium. Now note that AST and APT are liver function tests. Serum creatinine is a kidney function test. And one more drug in this section, and these are the potassium removing resins. These would be used for patients who have hyperkalemia, for instance, people in renal failure. And this is kaexalate. Kaexalate can be either given by mouth or by enema. And what it does is it's a sodium potassium exchange resin. So people with extremely high potassiums that are high enough that it might cause them to go into cardiac arrest may be given this. If it's given by enema, it's a six hour retention enema. It can also be given by mouth. And then you need to keep an eye on the other electrolytes because it can affect the rest of them, not just the serum potassium. So if it asked a question said, what would you monitor on the patient taking k -exalate? It would be electrolytes, and that would be your key um, thing that you need to monitor. This segment is on hormonal agents. And we're going to start right off with a question. The client is diagnosed as having insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. She received NPH insulin at 7.30 a.m. When is she most apt to develop a hypoglycemic reaction? Mid-morning, mid-afternoon, early evening, or during the night? And the correct answer is number two, mid-afternoon. Note that she had NPH insulin. When the time for a hypoglycemic reaction is peak action. And so that would be about six to eight hours after uh, they receive the uh, injection at 7.30, so mid-afternoon. I think you should know about regular and NPH insulin. You should know that regular onsets quickly within a half an hour to an hour peaks in two to four hours and by six to eight hours is all gone. On the other hand, MPH insulin kicks in about the time that regular peaks and peaks about the time that regular quits. If you set your charts up this way, I think you can remember the insulins. MPH insulin acts all day and then some. So I think you should know regular and NPH insulin. When you have questions about a patient receiving insulin, obviously you teach the patient what there is to know. You teach them that this is sub-Q, but that unless they're extremely emaciated because we have such a short needle, you can give it at a 90 degree angle. That we want to do blood or urine testing. Blood testing is more common. Uh, regular um, finger stick tests of their blood sugar. You will teach them what they need to know about their diet, the signs of hypo and hyperglycemia. Alcohol should not be consumed by diabetics. It's going to affect the blood glucose level. And smoking also blocks the action of insulin. For more detail about the management of diabetes, I would refer you to the endocrine uh, DVD in this tape series. Now an insulin pump is another way to administer insulin. The pump is small, about the size of a pager perhaps. You have a, a syringe in here and a drive mechanism that puts the insulin and just continually uh, puts the insulin into um, the patient's system. Now this goes into the subcutaneous tissue in the abdomen. The device itself can be hidden in a pocket, hooked on a bra, under clothing. Uh, there can be, they will do frequent blood sugar tests, and then they can raise or lower the amount of glucose that's given. Some of them come with a lot of ability to program different programs. 
Uh, some will just raise the amount, get themselves a bolus at mealtime. This really helps with the management of insulin. Other drugs being used for diabetic patients, your oral anti-diabetic agents. These are primarily for your type 2 diabetics. The sulfonylureas have been around for a long time. These stimulate insulin production and therefore make the patient hungry. Glepizide and gliburide are two of the more common ones in use today. The uh, glitazones, and I'm going to call them glitazones because this is a very hard name to say, improve insulin receptor activity so they make the insulin receptors work better. These are commonly used for diabetics. Uh, you might also see drugs like metformin or glucophage. Alpha-glucosidose inhibitors slow the digestion of carbohydrates. This is a drug like a carbose or precos, and those are sometimes used as well. A question. An adolescent has recently been diagnosed as having insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Insulin is prescribed. The client asks why insulin cannot be given by mouth. What is the best reply for the nurse to make? One, insulin is irritating to the stomach. Two, gastric juices destroy insulin. Three, oral insulin is too rapidly absorbed. Or four, you can take it by mouth once the acute phase is over. And the correct answer is number two, gastric juices destroy insulin. Insulin is a protein and it's going to be destroyed by the gastric juices. So it must be given either IV or sub-Q. Another uh, type of hormonal agent I want us to look at are steroids. Now, steroids, as you recall, are put out by the adrenal cortex. Patients that receive steroids may be those who are deficient, uh, such as those with Addison's disease. They could also be used to treat autoimmune disorders, prevent rejection um, they have for their immunosuppressive effect, so their anti-inflammatory effect. So they're given for lots of different conditions. The major side effect is Cushing syndrome, and here's a picture of a woman with Cushing syndrome. For further discussion of Cushing syndrome, I would refer you to the endocrine DVD, the section on the adrenal cortex. Now, um, the major side effects, we said Cushing syndrome. Um, if you are, are giving a patient an anti-inflammatory drug, Sometimes they can end up with unrecognized infections, so we have to be alert for that. You can get fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Uh, they are known to cause ulcers, which means that you're always going to give it with food. Uh, they raise blood sugar, uh, so we need to monitor their blood glucose levels. It's important for us to note that whenever steroids are being discontinued, they are gradually tapered. If we are giving steroids to, for patients, say, with either uh, bilateral adrenalectomies or Addison's disease, we want to give two-thirds of the dose in the morning and a third of the dose in the afternoon to more uh, mimic the way the body puts out steroids. If we are giving it as an, um, to prevent rejection, as uh, anti-inflammatory uh, type of agent, then the dose is usually given in the morning when it causes fewer side effects. A question for us. The nurse is caring for a woman who had a bilateral adrenalectomy. Which statement the client makes indicates she understands her medication regimen? One, I will take the medicine until I feel better. Two, I will stop taking the medicine until I talk with my doctor. Three, I will stay away from my grandchildren when they are sick. Or four, I will stop taking the medicine immediately if my face or ankles start to swell. And the question asked us that she understands her medication regimen. And the only one that indicates that is choice number three, knowing that she will be more susceptible to infections when she is being given an immunosuppressant drug. The others are all incorrect. She will take that medicine until she's told to gradually taper it. But with a bilateral adrenalectomy, she'll never be told to taper it. She'll be taking that medicine the rest of her life. Um, so 
answers number one and two make no sense at all because she's going to take that medicine forever. Um, and four makes no sense at all either. She might get swollen ankles, but the dosage could be adjusted, but she will not stop taking that medicine. Now, thyroid medication. Uh, we patient who has either hypothyroidism or had a thyroidectomy may need various forms of thyroid medication. Now, clearly, the adverse effects would be hyperthyroid symptoms if they got too much of it. Uh, angina, we have to be alert for, and tachycardia, and sometimes it causes insomnia. Uh, so those would be things that would suggest adverse reactions to thyroid medication. There are thyroid antagonists, drugs that block the action of thyroid. Uh, drugs like PTU, propylthiouracil, and tapazole. Uh, we sometimes will give those before surgery on the thyroid gland to shrink it and make it uh, smaller and less vascular. The side effects are rare. Uh, when they occur, it can be serious, a granulocytosis, but they're extremely rare. Other drugs we want to look at, androgens, male hormones, testosterone. This can be given to people either as a replacement hormone and a man who's not making enough, um, or we can use it when we want to really shut down some of the female hormones, so in breast cancer or fibrocystic breast disease or even endometriosis. Side effects can include acne. That's pretty much with all your... Um, Hormone, your sex hormone drugs can cause ac acne. Gynecomastia, meaning female type breasts. Men who take testosterone end up with uh, a large breast. Changes in libido and also other mood changes. People that take a lot of testosterone can sometimes end up with uh, anger and, and hostility and, and easy to anger. Uh, virilization was a side effect, and that is. Uh, more masculinization or masculine looking symptoms. Women who take it could get hair on their chinny chin chin, they could get a beard and a deep voice. Now priapism listed as a side effect there means an erection that won't go away. Uh, and this can be excruciatingly painful. If the man should develop that, they might even need to go to the emergency room. Other hormonally related drugs, uh, sexual hormone estrogens and progestins are female hormones. Estrogens are given as replacement hormones, sometimes at menopause or following removal of the ovaries. They can also be given to men um, to help treat prostate cancer, to shut down their hormone system. And estrogens are often a part of contraceptive medication. Progesterone is also uh, a major hormone in your birth control pills, and it can be for menstrual abnormalities um, that we use progestin. Now, adverse effects would be changes in menstrual flow, fluid retention, clots, always clots with the hormones. The thrombophlebitis and clots are a major side effect, and it can raise blood pressure. Now, we want to pull out a little bit about oral contraceptives. And oral contraceptives fool the brain into thinking that it's pregnant. So it contains progestin and usually also some estrogen. But it's the progestin that tells the brain that the body not to make any more eggs because it's got, it thinks that the body is pregnant. One of the things that they might ask you questions about if the uh, person taking oral contraceptives forgets to take a pill for one day, they should take two tablets the next day. If they forget it for two days, they could take two tablets for two days. If it's more than that, use another method of contraception and start over with the next cycle. Now smoking, obviously, smoking increases the risk of, uh, of clotting complications. So if they smoke more than half a pack a day, they should not take oral contraceptives. We know that the swelling and the nausea and the vomiting kinds of side effects are worse the first two or three and after that they generally are much milder. Let's take a look at a question. A young woman who is taking birth control pills calls the nurse and says she forgot to take her pills 
for three days. What should the nurse tell her to do? Take two tablets today, then resume your normal dosing. Two, take two tablets for two days. Three, continue with the normal administration of the medication. Four, discontinue and start over next month. Well, the correct answer is number four. It's three pills. So she um, needs to start over the next month. But we might also add to that, use another method of contraception. On the other side of the coin are fertility agents. And these are drugs that stimulate ovulation. So I've listed several of them here for you. Clomid, Perganol, I think have been on the exam. And a major side effect of these drugs is multiple births. Sometimes they can cause ovarian cysts as well. Now another group of drugs are oxytoxics, and these are ones that make the uterus contract. So they can be given to reduce postpartum bleeding. Methogen is commonly used postpartally to, to decrease bleeding. Uh, we can use drugs like oxytocin or pitocin to stimulate labor, and sometimes it's used in that, um, uh, for that purpose. If it's given to stimulate labor, the key thing you should remember is that you, they should be no contractions longer than two minutes, uh, than every two minutes lasting 60 seconds. So if a woman has contractions more frequently than every two minutes times 60 seconds, that medication should be discontinued. And that's likely to be given IV. So if you notice the contractions that last longer than 60 seconds, come more frequently than every two minutes, stop the IV and notify the charge nurse immediately. This segment is on gastrointestinal. As we start, we're going to look at some of the drugs that are used to treat ulcers and other GI illnesses. First one I want us to look at are H2 antagonists. These are itidines. These are drugs like Tagamed, Zantac, uh, but notice that their generic names are all itidines. A couple of things to remember about it. They could cause diarrhea and dizziness, sometimes a dry mouth. I think you should note that the elderly sometimes get confused with these drugs as they do with many drugs. Cymetidine is really best given with meals and smoking interferes with the action of cymetidine or tagamet. The others, it doesn't matter so much about being with meals, uh, but tagamet is best with meals. Another drug I want us to look at is Prilosec. This reduces the production of gastric acid. It does it by a different mechanism than the H2 antagonists do. And this can be used for a whole host of conditions. The reflux disease, ulcers, esophagitis. Another one to remember are the GI anticholinergics. These are drugs like belladonna, banthine, probanthine. These are used for things like ulcers, also irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis. The major side effects of the anticholinergics are red, hot, dry, blind, mad. So some people say red is a beet, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, meaning that they're warm, flushed, and dry. Uh, blind as a bat, meaning that the dilated pupils make them have blurred vision. They aren't truly blind. And mad as a hatter, they get confused. These are your side effects of all your anticholinergics, whether they be GI or nervous system anticholinergics. And the mad as a hatter is confusion. Another group of drugs are, are the drugs that are called sucrophate or caraphate. These drugs actually bind or coat the ulcer. So you can see in the picture that green kind of coating, it coats the ulcers. It also coats the lining of the stomach and the small bowel here. It coats everything, in fact, so that if you had taken another medication, it would bind and coat that so it wouldn't be absorbed. So a key thing to remember on that is that we don't give it um, for two hours after you've taken another medication, but it's best to be given before meals. Helicobacter is the organism that causes ulcers, your stomach and duodenal ulcers. It causes most of them. 
And since we now know this is a, caused by a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, we treat ulcers with antibiotics. And the only a antibiotic here that we did not talk much about when we, in the antibiotic section of this um, pharmacology DVD, is metronidazole or flagyl. And the thing you need to know about that one is that the patient should not drink alcohol when they're taking metronidazole or flagyl because it will make them have an antabuse-like reaction. In other words, they'll get violently sick to their stomach. Um, they are usually then given another antibiotic, such as amoxicillin or tetracycline. Uh, now, they are then given a drug to decrease gastric acid production like a meprazil or one of the H2 antagonists that we just spoke about. Sometimes they are also given a source of bismuth, be, such as Pepto-Bismol, because H. pylori does not like bismuth. Other drugs that are used to treat uh, um, ulcer-like illnesses are antacids. Antacids bring the stomach pH all the way from 1 or 2, which it commonly is, up to 3 or 3.5. Three now that's still acid, but it's less acid than it was before. There are several types of antacids. Magnesium-based antacids cause diarrhea as a side effect. Aluminum-based antacids, such as amphigel or gyocil, cause constipation. They also bind the phosphates, and that can in turn weaken bones. Sodium carbonate is a common, or sodium products are commonly used antacids. Now, their, their bad downside, if you will, is that they retain sodium and fluid. Uh, a lot of people will use baking soda, uh, bicarbonate of soda, as an antacid. If the person has high blood pressure or fluid retention, this would not be a good choice. Calcium carbonate is also a type of antacid. Uh, Tums is a good example of this. Now. A lot of people take Tums uh, as an antacid, and some people take Tums as a calcium source. It's relatively inexpensive. It comes in pretty colors and flavors, uh, and a lot of people will use it as a um, calcium source as well as an antacid. We also need to know about antidiarrheals. In antidiarrheals, we have both the narcotic and the non-narcotic. Pepto-bismol, Caopectate Imodium are non-narcotic antidiarrheals. The thing I think you need to remember about Pepto-Bismol, not only does it contain bismuth, which turns your stool black, but it also contains salicylates, uh, which is important to note if the patient cannot tolerate salicylates. Lamotyl and paragoric are opiate derivatives, so you need to monitor respirations when the patient is on them. These are also controlled substances. Now, you don't give antidiarrheals for more than 48 hours without a doctor's uh, knowledge and prescription. Uh, people should not take uh, antidiarrheals when the diarrhea is related to poison because you want to get rid of the poison. So, unfortunately, they're going to have to work through their diarrhea and get rid of the poison that's in their system. On the opposite side of the coin, we need to look at laxatives. Laxatives uh, come in several types. Bulk forming laxatives such as Metamucil and Fibrocon are relatively mild, uh, gentle. They just make the stools bulkier. Emollients such as Colace make the stools softer. Hyperosmolar laxatives pull fluid uh, and so they create then um, rather strenuous bowel movements. These can be saline derivatives uh, such as your Fleet's Phosphosoda type things. Milk of Magnesia is hyperosmolar, can pull fluid in uh, and create ma uh, rather forceful evacuation of stools. There are stimulants that actually stimulate peristalsis. Castor oil is a good example of that. And then uh, Dolcolax uh, is another commonly used uh, laxative. Now, we do not give laxatives if people have symptoms of appendicitis. So right lower quadrant pain um, would contraindicate uh, 
encouraging them to take a laxative. Signs of intestinal obstruction would also contraindicate taking a laxative. You want to teach patients who are taking laxatives regularly that rather than taking laxatives, it would be a good idea to practice fluid, fiber, opportunity, and, activi and activity, meaning fluid and fiber to, lose, to soften the stools, opportunity to go when you need to go, heed nature's call, and then, of course, activity stimulates peristalsis. There are a lot of people that abuse laxatives, and the biggest group are probably the senior citizens. Uh, so this is a group where we could do a lot of instructions because laxatives really should be for short-term use only. Another group of drugs are anti-emetic drugs. These are obviously drugs to decrease vomiting. There's quite a list of them here. Uh, you'll find that a number of these drugs are used for people that have vomiting from cancer chemotherapy. The Reglan, Zofran, Kytril are commonly used in people with cancer chemo. Uh, Compazine may be as well. Dramamine is commonly used as an anti-motion sickness drug. The major side effects of these are anticholinergic in nature. The dry mouth, that red hot dry blind mad that we talked about. They can also, because they are central nervous system acting drugs, cause drowsiness and hypotension, particularly orthostatic hypotension. Now the other side of the issue is emetics, drugs to stimulate vomiting. Apple morphine will do it, but the more commonly used drug is syrup of Ipecac. Now you do not give syrup of Ipecac if the person is unconscious, having seizures, or they have swallowed something that is caustic or an oil-based um, substance such as furniture polish, kerosene, uh, insect spray, for instance. Pancreatic enzymes are used for people, obviously, where they're not getting enough of their own pancreatic enzymes. In cystic fibrosis, the ducts are blocked by thick mucus, and in pancreatitis, they're blocked by inflammation, so that those enzymes that digest food, the uh, uh, amylase for carbohydrates, the trypsin for protein, and lipase for fats is not getting into the small bowel. If that's the case, then they are given pancreatic enzymes, such as pancreatin, pancrease, allozyme. They are given these with food, with the meal, because the whole purpose of these enzymes is to uh, digest the food. So they're given with food, and we do not give them with antacids. Let's look at a question. Pancreatin or dizymes tablets are ordered TID for a child with cystic fibrosis, which best indicates to the nurse that the medication is being taken properly. One, his stools are smaller and less foul smelling. Two, the mother states he no longer tastes salty when I kiss him. Three, he is less afraid of strangers. Four, his appetite is improved. We are asked that the medication is being taken properly. It would be number one. His stools are smaller and less foul smelling because that would indicate that he is digesting his food uh, better. This segment is on cancer and drugs affecting the immune system. The first thing I want us to look at are anti-neoplastics or cancer drugs. We can think of cancer as cell division gone crazy, and so what these drugs do is interfere with cell division. So virtually all of these uh, drugs interfere with cell division. They do it by different means, but I don't think for NCLEX that you have to know how each particular category of drug interferes with cell division. Now, if they interfere with cell division, they're non-selective. Most of these drugs, don't, they just interfere with cell division in general. So the side effects of these drugs relate to other areas where there are rapidly dividing cells. And the bone marrow is the biggest of these. So uh, people that are taking drugs, cancer drugs, usually get bone marrow suppression because that's where your most rapidly dividing cells in the body are. 
So that means that they don't have enough white cells, so they are immunocompromised. They don't have enough red cells, so they are anemic. They don't have enough platelets, so they bleed easily. And these, this is usually the most dose-limiting side effect of antineoplastics. Now, others, other side effects include stomatitis. The lining of the GI tract from the mouth all the way down to the other end is replaced every 48 to 72 hours. So that explains why they have mouth sores, stomatitis. Now, by the way, if they had stomatitis, would it be better for them to take Listerine mouthwash or viscous lidocaine mouthwash? That's right, viscous lidocaine. Listerine is alcohol-based and would be very painful whereas viscous lidocaine is a local anesthetic. Nausea, vomiting, anorexia are other GI tract symptoms due in part from the effect on the GI tract and also in part to the stimulation of the vomiting center in the brain. Uh, the vincas, you might get constipation. Most of the other drugs tend to cause diarrhea. You can get an increase in uric acid levels, so we get hyperuricemia. Patients who have high uric acid levels or who are at risk for it may be taking allopurinol, and as you recall, you have to push fluids when you take allopurinol. Liver toxicity uh, is a common side effect of, of cancer drugs. Loss of hair is a common side effect. Extravasation means that if you had an IV, for instance, that infiltrated, these drugs are so toxic that you would have a huge area of uh, damage and tissue damage, tissue death. So uh, we don't want IVs that contain cancer chemo drugs to infiltrate because they can do lots and lots of tissue damage should they infiltrate. There's one specific side effect I want us to talk about, and this has to do with hemorrhagic cystitis that we sometimes see with a drug called cytoxin. Now you can see it with some other drugs as well. And what we know is that the liver breaks the drug down, but the kidney excretes the breakdown products. And the longer these metabolites are in the bladder, and the more concentrated the urine is, the more damage it will do to the bladder. So we push fluids and we have them empty the bladder frequently to help prevent hemorrhagic cystitis. And we know there's been questions about that on NCLEX as well. There are hormonal antineoplastics. And these tend to be organ specific. So for breast cancer, they might get tamoxifen which blocks the part of estrogen that stimulates the growth of estrogen-dependent breast cancer. For prostate cancer, they might be given female hormones to decrease the production of the male hormones that stimulate growth of prostate cancer. They do not have the whole bone marrow depression and all of those side effects. Their side effects are more hormone-related side effects. There are drugs that are called immunosuppressants, which are given to prevent rejection in transplants, for instance. Um, now, some of, most of these are easy to recognize. Look at Imuran. You know it's an immune system. How about Sandimmune? You know it affects the immune system. But the advent of the cyclosporine or Sandimmune has really made uh, transplants much more successful. But one of the major side effects of immunosuppressants is bone marrow depression. You can also get liver and kidney damage from them. Now, I thought we would talk for a moment about concepts related to immunity. Active immunity is when the patient or the person is their immune system has stimulated and is producing antibodies against a given uh, organism. It takes time to develop active immunity, but it's long-lasting. Vaccines and toxoids produce active immunity, where your own body is actively making antibodies against an organism. Passive immunity, on the other hand, is when you sort of borrow antibodies that were made outside of you. So, now, they act immediately, but they're very short-term, only as long as those particular antibodies are circulating. 
for instance, an immune serum globulate. So this is taken from blood that's been donated, and this, the patients that donate the blood have antibodies circulating against a, give, give a number of diseases. And so we take those and give them to a person who's been exposed to that disease. So if there are tetanus antibodies, we could give the tetanus immune globulin to a patient who's been um, exposed to tetanus and has never had an immunization. This would give them some immediate short-term antibodies. So active, the, the person actively makes their own antibodies. Passive, they simply use the antibodies that were borrowed, if you will, from another person. Now, I think you should know the immunization schedule. This is also discussed in the pediatric section. Hepatitis B is given at birth one month and six months. DTP, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, two months, four months, six months, with boosters at about 18 months, and immediately preschool. By the way, all those preschool immunizations are mandatory. All those in that years four to six are mandatory. Now, after the age of six, we no longer give pertussis or whooping cough. So from that point on, the every 10-year tetanus immunizations are tetanus and diphtheria only. Polio is given at two months, four months, 18 months, and then when you start school. Right now, we are using injectable polio vaccine. People who have been immunized with oral vaccine are immunized. There's no problem with that, but we are just preferring to use the injectable now. Most authorities recommend one polio uh, vaccination in adulthood as well as those in childhood. HIV is Haemophilus influenza B, two months, four months, six months, and then about 12 or 15 months, and you're done with that. PCB is pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Uh, this is given about uh, um, two months, four months, six months, and then about 12 or 15 months. PCV is a vaccination against child against infant pneumonia. We also have a vaccine for senior citizens uh, for uh, against pneumonia as well, and we give that to people 65 and over. MMR measles, mumps, rubella is given at 15 months, and again preschool about four to six years of age. Varicella at one year, although you may see children now who are older than a year who've not had the vaccine because it's only been available for a few years. So if you had an eight or a 10 year old that had never had the vaccine uh, and never had the disease, never had chicken pox, then they would be a good candidate to get the vaccine. We also usually do tuberculin skin tests. These are not immunizations, please. They are uh, skin tests to detect the presence of antibodies against TB. And these are given at, usually the first one is one year. It's mandatory before they start school, but frequently they'll get them annually uh, if there's any TB at all in the community. A couple other thoughts about vaccines. Um, we said BCG is something we do not routinely give, but remember that people in other parts of the world have had BCG vaccine against tuberculosis, and if they've had it, they will have a positive PPD if it's working. Hepatitis B, um, an immunoglobulin is available, so if a person has been exposed and never vaccinated, uh, we could give that if, to them as long as it's within a week of exposure. We also have other immune globulins. We have a tetanus immune globulin, and an immune serum globulin uh, that can be used for a number of different uh, conditions. And the last one that I want us to take a look at is Rogam. Rogam prevents the development of anti-RH antibodies. It is given to non-sensitized RH negative mothers who have RH positive babies. It must be given within 72 hours of delivery of the baby or within 72 hours of a miscarriage or abortion. And we usually also give this about 28 weeks of gestation.